All right. Good morning, church. God is good. Amen. And all the time? Amen. Well, we're excited today. We're starting our walkthrough of the book of Genesis. And a lot, a lot of excitement around this. I'm glad you're here today as we jump into this. I'm excited as we continue to worship as family units. And Michelle is our director of children's ministry. She's got some awesome things to share with you this morning. Michelle? Morning, everybody. So I'm excited that we have some new free resources um, as we go through the book of Genesis. Um, we have the Answers book for kids. So this is for grandparents, parents, aunts, uncles, whoever, for you to go through with kids. And it'll answer some of the questions that they'll have when we're talking about Genesis. Then this one is called Let There Be Light, and this is to add to your preschool library. And it's an opposites book, but it tells about the days of creation, so it's really good. And then we have new sermon notes um, coming for um, the book of Genesis. Shay's been working hard on um, creating these for us. And then this colorful one is for parents, grandparents, whoever, to take home and talk with your kids about the things that we talk about in the sermon. So some kid kid-related activities that they could do um, concerning Genesis. Awesome. Thank you, Michelle. You guys can pick up those resources at our Next Steps table today, and they are awesome resources um, to go through with your kids. And so grab those today before you go. A couple other quick announcements. Life groups are starting this week. Hey, yeah, yay. We're excited for our life groups to kick back off. We were off for the month of August as we went through the Theology Matter series, and our life groups are picking up this week. And so if you're not involved with the life group, get involved today with the life group. We've got tons of options to be a part of a life group in your area. And so you can either, fill, you can either join a life group by filling out the communication card in the bulletin and placing it in one of the offering plates, or you can actually meet Nevin after the service at the back in our Next Steps area, and he'll get, connect, get you connected into one of our life group ministries. But be sure to join a life group as we go through the book of Genesis. We're going to dive deep into God's Word. And so as you receive those notes as you came in this morning, you'll see it's set up in a few different ways. Number one, it's set up for you to be able to take notes, fill in blanks as I preach, but also for you to be able to write your own notes down. And I encourage you, when God's speaking to you, write down what God's telling you so that you remember it. Because if you're like me, you're going to go home and have lunch today and take a nap. And when you get up, everything that happened this morning is gone. And so write down when God speaks to you. And then after that, you'll see there are our life group questions. So you have the ability to go through the questions, spend some time studying God's word, and then go to life group to discuss with other Christians what you're learning in God's word and how we apply it to our lives. And then you have tools for life to help you engage with your family, something you can do this week to apply God's word to your family this week. And so... Be a part of that. If you're a life group leader, we got some resources in the back for you. One of the things I want to encourage you to pick up today is our Table Talk magazine. We provide Table Talk magazine for our church members and for our visitors. And I'm holding up for you. We got these, and I'm really excited, and this is why I'm sharing this today. This is actually October's. September's is back there, and it's fantastic. But I'm excited about October's because October actually goes along with us starting the book of Genesis. And so the first part of the Table Talk magazine is an in-depth an in-depth study on a, on a topic, and for the month of October, it's actually the covenants of the Old Testament, which is mainly out of Genesis. And so I encourage you to take that. You can read more about that. And then the day-to-day, -day, there's a page for each day for a, a quiet time and for you to go a little bit deeper into God's Word. And as you work through, the whole month of October is working through the book of Revelation. So you'll be studying the first book of Scripture as in church, and then in your quiet time, the last book of Scripture, which are completely connected to one another. So pick those up and be in God's Word on a daily basis. Well, I'm excited for us to dive into the book of Genesis, and I'm excited for us to begin to worship our King. So will you stand with us as we pray and prepare our hearts for worship today? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, I thank you as we stand in this place, we are sinners saved by your grace, not because we deserve it, not because we can earn it, but simply because of the expression of how good you are through the grace you give us. 
And Scott, we pray that you teach us to understand you more and more correctly according to your word. As your word is preached today, may it set in our heart and may your spirit use it to reveal who you are more and more to us. As we sing the truths of your word, God, may that understanding of who you are sit in our heart so we can know you correctly according to your word. Think correctly, feel correctly, believe correctly according to your word. And God, may all that we do today bring great honor to our Savior, our King, and our God. In your great and powerful name, the name of Jesus, we pray today. Amen. Good morning, church. Please join us as we sing. Our Father everlasting, the all creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and our defense. everyone. 
All right, today we're going to be in the book of Genesis, chapter 50, is where we'll be reading from this morning. And for those who don't know, uh, my name is Mark Dominguez, and I am the student minister here at South Peoria Baptist Church. And what a wonderful day it is to be worshiping God this morning with you guys as we dive into the book of Genesis today. It's our first day. So we're going to be starting in verse 15 of chapter 50. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph, saying, Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him and said, We are your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. To accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful to be in your house this morning, Lord. And we ask for your spirit of humility, Lord, as we approach your word, and that you would allow us to understand, Father, and that throughout the week and throughout the rest of our lives, Lord, that you would help us to apply it practically, Lord. We thank you for the privilege and opportunity it is to, ha- to be here in your house, Lord, and to worship you and to come together as the body, Lord, and give you the glory. And we pray as we dive into the book of Genesis, Lord, that we would understand and that we would live it out, Lord for your glory, and we give you the praise and honor this morning, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen, church. Please join us as we continue to sing. I see the work of your hands Galaxy spinning It's a gentle and thundering noise, oh God, all that you are is so overwhelming. I delight myself in you, captivated by your beauty. I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you. You are 
are glorious, oh God. There is no one more glorious. You are glorious, God. You are the most glorious. I delight myself in you, in the glory of your presence. I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed. you gave when you died on the cross and rose again but God you gave it anyway God you are so good let us worship you for who you are teach us through your word who you are let us know you more accurately and see you more clearly let us serve you more fully because of your spirit we pray these things in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. All right, church. We get to dig into the book of Genesis. And let me tell you, I love that song we just sang, overwhelmed by the presence of his glory. And the more we understand our God, and we'll see this and witness this as we go through the book of Genesis, we will become overwhelmed by the magnificent the power and the glory of God as we know him more and more. And we get to come into the moments of creation with him and see what he has accomplished in history past in what he did in creating this world, this universe. And we get to start in Genesis. And I love this idea of Genesis. And this, the Hebrew word for Genesis is Bereshit. Everybody say Bereshit. Say, turn to the person like Bereshit. They're going to turn you all into Hebrew scholars, right? And that word literally is the first word of the Bible. And it says, it means literally first things, the beginning, the first thing. And it is Bereshit bara. Bereshit in Hebrew is such a beautiful language. In the beginning created our God. God created the heavens and the earth. And I love the book of Genesis, written by Moses as the human author, God as the divine author, working through his hand and his personality, his character and his understanding. And he wrote this, and actually, he wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, known as the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, which we call the law, the Old Testament, the law. And so he is the author of that, probably sitting in the middle of the Exodus, at the base of Mount Sinai, we see and begin to read the book of Genesis. It's probably where he wrote that. And he wrote all five of these books, almost all five, at the end of, of the last book in Deuteronomy. Moses dies, and Joshua probably finishes it out telling us Moses died, because Moses can't write Moses died if he's dead, right? And so he writes 99.9% .9 of the first five books. And this is written 1400 B.C., in the middle of the Exodus, coming out of a polytheistic world and being, in, being emerged in all of these fake and false deities, the God of the sun and the God of the moon and the God of the river and the God of the ocean and the God of the birds. And then in the middle of this, the very first verse, the very first thing written all of God's scripture for the Israelites to catch and understand, in the beginning, God created. There is no other God. There is only one God of creation. And what we know about God, what we know about all of creation, what we know about ourselves, about salvation and goodness of God, all starts in the beginning in Genesis. This is where our understanding of the character of God and what he is doing begins. It answers the question Genesis does, who is God, who we are, where did we come from, and how do we get back to God? 
and it's a beautiful, beautiful book. It is neatly structured, finely crafted. The first 11 chapters are what we call the primeval history. It's going to cover the creation account and five narratives, five stories that lead us up to the flood and the Tower of Babel. And then the last part is 12 through 50 covers the patriarchs, Abraham. And God calling him out of his people and creating for himself a new people, covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And as we look at this book, I love this. One of my favorite books of all time, maybe you're a mystery, a mystery uh, novel reader. I love mysteries. I love thrillers. I drive my, my wife nuts because I also like to listen to books. And so I drive her nuts because I'm always listening to something. And so, but here's the thing with mysteries. If you are in a really, really good mystery, you want to know how it ends, right? So sometimes we're tempted to jump to the end and find out how the book ends and then go back and finish reading the book knowing how it ends so you can see all the pieces come together, right? My favorite book of all time was a book by my, one of my favorite authors who's Agatha Christie. Agatha Christie is a master not a mystery writer and she wrote a book called And Then There Was None. And it's about... 10 people being trapped on an island in this mansion, and there is a, a, a poem on the wall. You may be familiar with the poem. The poem is 10 Little Indians. 10 Little Indians went out to play, you know, and then something happens to each of the little Indians, and people begin to die on the island based on this poem, right? The, tenth, the first person dies, how the first Indian dies in the poem, and you're trying to figure out who's the killer, and I love that. And I love to reread that because I know the ending and I love to go back and try and figure out all the little hints and clues. And so for us today, the best place for us to start is the beginning, the Beit Rashid. But in order for us to understand it, we're going to start at the end of the beginning today. We're going to start in Genesis 50 because what we see here in the story of Joseph is he gives us a lens and an understanding in which we can go back and study all of Genesis with all of scripture with, which is a profound truth. And so as we understand what this scripture is and what, what's going on here in the midst of Joseph. And so let me just give us a little bit of background of Joseph. We're not going to dive too deeply into it because I don't want to ruin it when we get there later in chapter 50. But what's going on for today? Joseph. Joseph has been kidnapped by his brothers. They were going to murder him. Instead, they made money and sold him into slavery gets sold into slavery in Egypt, goes into Egypt, works for a guy named Potiphar and becomes popular with Potiphar, works his way up to the top of Potiphar's house. He's in control of everything Potiphar does until Potiphar's wife makes a false accusation against Joseph and falsely accuses him of rape. Then he gets thrown in prison and forgotten about. And it's in prison he's forgotten about and Pharaoh has a dream, and no one else can, can interpret the dream. And suddenly, somebody in Pharaoh's court goes, oh, but there was this guy one time back when I was in prison that told me about his dream, was able to interpret my dream. So forgotten about in prison, they bring Joseph before Pharaoh. Pharaoh's able to interpret the dream. And the dream is, there's going to be a great famine, right? All over the world, there's going to be a great famine, seven years of plenty, seven years of famine, and many people are going to suffer, many people are going to die if we don't prepare. So Pharaoh takes Joseph, puts him in control of all of Egypt, says, you're in charge, make sure we make it through the famine. So Joseph spends seven years building up all the storehouses so that all of Egypt will go with, will, won't go without food, and then the famine hits. And then what happens is that famine doesn't just hit Egypt, it hits, hits the whole world. So meanwhile, back at the ranch, Joseph's brothers and father and all their families are starving. And their father says, you need to go to Egypt. They have food and ask for food. And they go to Egypt and they end up standing in front of Joseph and don't know it. And Joseph, in his mercy and his grace by God, forgives them, right? There's a whole story behind that. We're not going to dive into that. But this catches us up to where we're at. They go back, they get their dad, they bring him to Egypt. Everybody is doing really well in Egypt. The family's been reunited. It's all great, right? Except something happens and dad dies. Old age. Now, family's not easy, is it? You can look at your family and you realize family's hard. And more often than not, it's more dysfunctional than it is healthy. And all of a sudden, Joseph's brothers think, the only reason Joseph was kind to us is because dad was alive. And now he's going to remember, we're the guys that threatened to kill him and sell him into slavery. So dad's dead. 
Now, this is an interesting passage to me. I don't know whether this statement is true or if they made it up, but they did the only thing they could think of. They sent a message to Joseph goes, hey, dad's last dying words was this. If you really love dad, you'll listen to his last dying words, and that was, you need to forgive us and not kill us, right? And it tells us Joseph went and wept. Like he couldn't even believe they were asking this. And then they stand in front of Joseph, and this verse happens in chapter 50 and verse 20, which echoes and was one of the most powerful verses through all of Scripture as Joseph stands as the judge, jury, executioner, all-powerful guy of Egypt in front of his brothers who sold him into slavery and threatened to kill him. And he makes this statement. I love it. The ESV puts it this way. Genesis 50, 20 puts it this way. As for you, you meant evil. Everyone say evil. You meant evil against me. But God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. And he brings to light here at the end, which is something we have to struggle with all the way from the beginning, and that is the problem of evil. And Joseph looks at his brother and says, what you meant for evil, God has meant for good. The theological premise of that is showing us evil is not above God, but God is above evil, and God is able to work all things for our good and for the glory of those who are called according to God's purposes, right? And so the existence of evil does not nullify the existence of God, but shows his power over it. God uses even evil things for good. But we still have to deal with the evil thing. And what we think of evil, maybe how you identify evil and how I identify evil is similar, and this is a mistake we often make. We inadvertently, without knowing it, we elevate ourselves to the level of God. And our view of evil is this. Anything that comes against me, works against my will, or works against my understanding of God, works against what I believe to be right, works against works against my worldview, anything that is working against my goals, my life, my dreams, that's evil. The problem is that's not correct, is it? That's not right. That's not what evil is. And Joseph gives us an incredible insight into what evil really is. And so in this insight, what's going on here is kidnapped by his own brothers, threatened to be murdered, sold into slavery, They take his coat, they dip it in blood, take it to dad and say he's been killed by a wild beast. He works his way up to the service of Potiphar, gets accused falsely of rape, gets thrown in prison, forgotten about in prison, and we would look at all the things that happened to Joseph and we would say that was, what was the word? Evil. Say evil. Evil. And you would be right. But maybe not for the right reason. You see, the reason it was evil, it wasn't evil because his brothers kidnapped Joseph. It wasn't evil that it was done to Joseph. It wasn't evil that they threatened to murder him because it was done to Joseph. It wasn't evil that he was sold into slavery because it was done to Joseph. It wasn't evil that he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife because it was Joseph it was done to. The reason it was evil things, see, we think evil is when it's done against us. That's what makes it evil. The reason it was evil is because those things broke God's laws and transgressed a holy God, which takes our understanding of evil off of ourselves. See, if it's about my world, if I'm the center of the universe and it's about my life, my story, my good, everything about me, then that's my definition of evil is anything that comes against me. That's not the biblical definition of evil. What evil actually is this, is that point. Go ahead and put it back up there for me. Evil is anything that works against God's will or character. When his brothers kidnapped him, it was evil because that works against God's will and character. It's called sin. It wasn't because Joseph. It was because God is God. And when they did that, it was a sin transgressing God's law, God's will and God's character. And so when we look at the problem of evil, we have to understand evil is anything that works against, not me, against me, it works against God's will and his character. And when we look at Joseph's story, 
His spiritual depth astounds me. Because when I look at Joseph's story, this is how I want to see Joseph's story. I want to see it as a prosperity story. I want to see it as an overcomer story. I want to look at Joseph, and I want to look at all the evil things that happened to Joseph. I want to look at Joseph enduring the suffering. Look at his faithfulness. Look at his patience and his endurance in the midst of all these evils and wrongdoings. And in the end, it all worked out for his good because he became the greatest, most powerful person in all of Egypt outside of Pharaoh. And we go, look at that. He's an overcomer. God is so good. Look at what God did. But church, that's not the story. And that's not the point. Looking at all that suffering, it wasn't that he overcame. That was the farthest thing from Joseph's mind because here's the deal. You've got family, I've got family. Family's messy and messed up, right? If you had a family member steal $100,000 from you, right? And the next day you want a million dollars in the publisher's clearinghouse. That doesn't undo what that family member did to you, does it? See, I want to look at Joseph and say, it's all good because now look where I'm at. His brothers knew that wasn't true. His brothers knew that they stood in fear in front of him because they had done evil. They had done wrong. They had broken God's law and they had done wrong to Joseph. And despite his power, despite his position, they knew that they had still done wrong and him being there doesn't undo that wrong. So that's not the story here. The story is not it's all good because look how I turned out. That's not what God is talking about when he overcomes. This is not about Joseph being an overcomer. This is about something greater than that. And what was that? What Joseph tells us, let's look at that verse again, Genesis 50, 20. You intended harm. That word harm is evil. You intended to hurt me. You intended to kill me. You intended evil against me. But God intended it for good. Everyone say good. Good. That's the opposite of evil. And what is the good? That he was powerful? No. That he was rich? No. That he had a position? No. What was the good? Joseph says that good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. The good is that God takes evil and uses it to save his people. Joseph didn't see his position and his power as the end goal or the benefit. As Joseph stood in front of his brothers on that day, he didn't have the mindset, look where I'm at now. Being in prison was worth it. He didn't have the mindset of, look where I'm at now. The fact that my brothers sold me into slavery, put me where I'm at today. It was none of that. What Joseph told his brothers in the midst of his people going to starve, the reason God put him in the pit, the reason that God put him in the jail through the evil of other people was for one purpose and one purpose only, to save his people from dying. That begins to blow our mind when we understand the spiritual depth of Joseph because I would have been like, guess who I am now, right? Dad's dead. We got some scores to settle, right? That's the sinful side of me, and I bet it's the sinful side of you. I've got brothers. If you've got brothers, you know what I'm talking about. We love each other, but man, we settle scores. Joseph said, no, I see God's hand at work and it has nothing to do with me being in power, it has nothing to do with my position, it has nothing to do with my wealth. Everything that I suffered for was for one good and one good only to save God's people. That is a powerful thought. And then we begin to see that echoed in Romans in the New Testament. Romans 8, remember we worked through this in this passage. Romans 8 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been a called according to his purpose. And what is his purpose? For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, to be made like Jesus, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, the firstborn among all who have been born again through Jesus Christ. That his promise is to work for the good, and what is the good? To save his people. Still today. So, there's a promise in here for us. 
And this is the lens that we need to read not only Genesis through, but through all of Scripture. And this is so encouraging. I want you to write this down. Whatever evil there is, whatever evil that exists, God will use it for good. And what is that good? The eternal, we'll find out next week, the eternal purpose of salvation for God's people. We look at our world right now and it's so discouraging sometimes. We see all the evil out there. But church, we can take courage knowing whatever evil exists, God is still at work today saving people through it. God is not only saving people through it, he's going to use it to turn people to repentance to save them. So as we look through scripture and we go back to Genesis, we are going to see evil, evil systematically increase and become greater and greater and greater and greater. And we're going to see that through that, God is at work and he's able to take any evil that happens and turn it for good. We're going to look at the first 11 chapters as we take time studying through Genesis. And the prime evil history after creation account gives us five narratives, five stories. We see Adam and Eve in the fall. We see Cain and Abel. And Cain kills Abel, right? Sin continues to get worse. Then we see the sons of men and the daughters of man with some kind of relational and physical and, and sin going on there. And then we move from there to the flood. And by the time we get to Noah, every thought of man was evil. Evil is expounding and increasing more and more and more. And finally, after God saves the world, mankind continues in their evil at the Tower of Babel that comes to a head in the ultimate arrogance and pride of man. And in these five narratives, as we study these, you're going to see there's a structure God has placed into them that not only plays out for them, but plays out for you and I today. And that is this. Number one, write this down. Here's the structure we find. This is what happens in these stories. Number one, God addresses the sin. The sin is explained. We see this in the account in Adam and Eve in the garden. We see this with Cain and Abel. We see this with the, the uh, sons of men and the daughters, uh, the sons of God and the daughters of men. We see this in the flood. We see this in the Tower of Babel. God says, this is wrong. This is sin. And after he identifies the sin and says why it's wrong, then there's some kind of talk. There is a speech by God announcing the penalty. Go ahead and write that down. There is a speech by God announcing the penalty. He's addressed the sin. He's identified the sin. Here's what you've done wrong. Now here's what's going to happen next as a result of that. But the goodness and the beauty of God's word, and we're going to see in Genesis in your life today and my life and throughout all of history is this. There's step three. And step three is this. After the penalties announced, God brings grace into the situation. And he does that to ease the misery sin causes. Sin has happened. You've sinned against a holy God. Now that you've sinned against a holy God, here's what's going to happen next. We've got to address the sin. But by the grace of God, you're not going to get what you deserve. God's going to bring an ease to the misery. But step four is God will punish the sin. He has to. He's just. His grace and his justice are not at odds with each other. He is perfect in his grace and his justice. And this makes his grace amazing. Because through all of the stories that we're going to read through Genesis, and in your story as well, there is an avalanche of sin that gets greater and greater and greater and greater. And in return, what happens is God's avalanche of grace overcomes and abounds more and more and more than sin ever could. Adam and Eve were punished. They sinned against God in the Garden of Eden. And that simple sin of just reading from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, we look at, it was just a fruit. It was one act of rebellion. It wasn't even that serious, we could say. We wouldn't think that, but it was. And in that one act, they deserved annihilation and death. God steps in and says, here's what you've done. Here's what's going to happen next. But in his grace, he withholds death and says, no, you're not I'm not going to destroy you now. I'm not going to bring you death in this moment. You're not going to be annihilated. The death sentence was removed, and instead they were removed from the garden. Cain kills his brother Abel, and God walks with him, addresses the sin. Here's what you've done wrong. Here's what's coming next. 
but I'm not going to kill you. And he places a mark on Cain so that no one else will touch Cain, an act of grace. By the time we get to the flood, all of mankind, all they think about is new ways to do evil. All they can think about are evil things. And God brings the flood to destroy creation. And in destroying creation, he provides in the ark. And I tell you, I can't wait for us to get there. It'll blow your mind when we learn the purpose and what is going on in the ark and the flood. His grace saves all of mankind through one family, through Noah. Reestablishes humanity and the grace. He doesn't give them what they deserve, all of mankind. He saves them. And then in the midst of the Tower of Babel and the arrogance and extreme pride of man who reject God, God takes them, disperses them, gives them new ethnicities and new languages and confuses them, spreads them out all over the earth as their punishment. And yet in his grace, he calls Abraham out. He says, out of you I will make one nation who will bless every other nation. And we see this over and over and over and over through Genesis, where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. And I love that. And so write this down. When we look at Genesis, the lens that we look at through this is it was grace from the beginning. And it will always be grace. Say grace. Church, this is good news. Because there's one thing you need and one thing only, and that's the grace of God. And it has always been grace from the beginning, and it will always be grace. And Paul sums that up in 520 of Romans, and I just quoted it. The law was brought in so the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, where evil increases, grace increased all the more. Amen. Even right now in the midst of the world, sin and evil is increasing. Since the beginning of time in Genesis, the avalanche has not stopped and it's getting more and more and more. And God's grace right now is increasing more and more and more. And this is so good because we begin to understand it was grace from the beginning. It will always be grace. God's grace was not a response to sin. Adam and Eve in the garden didn't eat from the tree and God go, oh, now I got to do something. It wasn't him trying to figure out a solution to evil. Before he said, let there be light, his grace was. The cross was. And it was the plan all along for you to have the grace of God in your life. It was grace from the beginning. It is grace till the end. It will always be grace. And it bounds more and more and more every moment. And it boggles my mind to think that there's more of God's grace left. And I think about it right now, church, as Christians. Listen how good this is. As we exist on the third rock from the sun, spinning through space. I love this. Every breath, every moment we have is an act of grace of God in your life. It's an act of gra grace of God for the world. And here is why. Scripture tells us not only did Jesus speak creation into being, and I can't wait for us to talk about how he created and what it means for him to be the creator, but it also says he sustains it and holds it all together. It is a false understanding of creation that it is some kind of midnight infomercial where you can baste a turkey and you just set it and forget it. That God spoke creation into being and it is what it is. It's not what God's word says. It says the sun came up this morning. Why did the sun come up this morning? Not because God allowed it. Because Jesus Christ causes it to. All of creation is held together in his hand until the moment when the Father says that's enough and Christ lets go of creation and it will cease to exist as we know it. Because all of creation exists and is sustained by Christ alone, which means as we float through space right now in this expanding, unmeasurable universe and all of these galaxies, every moment we breathe is a moment of grace of God in this world. Why? So that his grace can abound, and it goes back to what Joseph said. 
so that many will be saved. And every breath we take shows that God's not done saving people yet. Every day we live shows God's not done saving people yet. And that grace is abounding more and more and more right now for us. So how do we apply this? When we look back through scripture, we're going to see where evil abounds, his grace abounds more and more and more. Wherever evil is, God's going to take it and use it for good. What's that good? To bring salvation to those who are lost, to continue to save into his family, Christians. That is his grace and the point of his grace. So number one, how do we apply it to our lives today? Number one, I want you to write this down. This is so encouraging, church. God's grace is so much bigger than our sin. Nothing we do will ever cause God to disown us or break his promises to us. Do you catch that, church? God's grace is way bigger than your sin could ever be. Which means if you're born again, your sins have been nailed to the cross, forgiven, and forgotten. Which means as a believer in Christ, born again, your place in his family is secure by what Christ did. Yet we still struggle with sin in this life. And when I fall into sin, it never will cause God to abandon me. It will never cause God to disown me. And yet what we see through all the scripture is that those who are in Christ are in Christ by his power forever. And so this is such a powerful truth. I love this. First Timothy says it this way. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. What, what does that mean? God has made promises and he will keep his word. He has made covenants, and he will keep his word. God will continue to keep his word. If you're a believer and you've been born again, God will keep his word to you. Your security for eternity is in Christ and Christ alone. And that needs to bring such freedom to us as Christians. This isn't a license to go and sin all we want. If we think that's what that means, we don't understand what it means to be saved but that our love for Christ abounds, his grace abounds, and every time that I do sin, I am torn over my sin because it's offended the God who loves me and has saved me, and I come to a place of repentance, and his grace is even greater than the sin that I have in my life, and it continues to be greater than the sin in my life. Number two, the ultimate purpose, I love this, the ultimate purpose of God's grace is to save us and make us like Jesus. The ultimate purpose of God's grace is to save us and make us like Jesus. I love that. Verse 29 of Romans, we read it earlier, chapter 8. This is the purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, made like Jesus. God's people will be made like Jesus. If you're a believer and you've been born again, God's purpose is to make you like Jesus. The first step is that you're born again. That's salvation. And I love this. Church, do you know there is more to God's grace than salvation? Do you know that, church? There is more to God's grace than salvation. Salvation is the first step experience. It's the first step for you to experience God's grace. It's just the beginning for the believer of God's grace. There's so much more, but what happens, and this is where we got to be careful, going back to what I just said on sin, we have to be careful, church, that we don't get stuck in the mud in our sin at salvation. This is so good, because many of us get stuck there, and we think this. We know we're saved, but then when our sin comes into our life and it rears its ugly head again, we think, why would God have saved me? Why would God have saved me? He knows how evil I am. He knows my heart. And I don't even know if I'm saved. And we think God's grace and forgiving sin is just about salvation. That's the first step. That's being born again, that you're being born again into the family of God. Your eternity by the grace of God is secured in Jesus Christ. And then there's more. 
then there's more. More grace, because you're not going to stop sinning. You're going to struggle with sin the rest of your life. And more grace comes. And more grace overcomes it. And it is, we're just guilty of thinking it's just salvation. And it's not. It's much, much, much more for you to experience God's grace in your life right now. It's not one and done. Salvation is secure. God's got another notch on his belt for a Christian. God doesn't leave us at salvation. He is saving us and making us. And let me tell you, you're going to need a whole lot of grace to be made like Jesus, aren't you? I'm going to need a whole lot of grace to be made like Jesus. And I'm going to mess it up a whole lot. And God's grace comes over and over and over. Salvation is the beginning and his grace is abounding in you right now. Now, if you're a believer in Christ, if you've been born again, his grace is abounding in you over and over and over right now. He's seeing the sin in your life and he's speaking to it. He's showing you this is wrong. He's saying this is what's going to happen because of the sin in your life. And then he's pouring grace into your life and making the punishment less than what you deserve because his ultimate purpose has always been grace to form you to be like Jesus. And here's a powerful truth that I want us to grasp and close on in this. Not just you. Not just you, but through you and for the good of all believers. Listen, church, this is so important for us to understand. So often, we look at the promises like Romans 8, for we know that God works all things to the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes, right? That is not an individual promise. That is a promise for the whole body of Christ. And think about it, church. We stand right here today, first century, the church wrote to us, the apostles, they were martyred. They went to their death preaching the gospel. We understand, and I teach this, you get this. We are intricately and deeply connected as the body of Christ. We are so connected. Your salvation today is connected to the obedience of the apostles in the first century church, that they preached the gospel faithfully. Your salvation is a part of that. They are pouring into you right now. The first and second century, third century church leaders after the apostles were killed who laid their lives down on the line, who were martyrs for the faith, who began to build the church after the apostles. We stand on their faith and they are pouring into us right now. The only way I can be made more like Christ is through Peter and John and Paul, through the first, second, and third century church fathers, through the great reformers like Luther. They are pouring into to us right now we are intricately connected through the power of the gospel as the body of Christ but not just them my ability to be made like Jesus is 100% connected to you for me to be made like Christ that promise is not about working for Jeremiah's good it's that his promise is that together for the good of all of us we will all be made mature like Jesus. Your ability to become more and more like Christ fully depends on me. I depend on you. Church, we need to stop looking at the promises of God's word as if it's for me and me alone. And we need to start looking at the promises of God's word and say, it's for us, we. And we stand together. God's grace, I think about this. Paul Paul wrote in 2 Timothy, we read it earlier. He says, I suffer for the elect, the church, the body of Christ, believers. Why? Everything that I'm enduring, everything that I'm receiving, all of the per persecution, the, all of the beatings, all of the suffering that I'm going through, I'm doing it for the church. Why does he say that in verse 10 of that chapter? He says, so that more will be saved. Because what this world means for evil God turns to good. And what is that good? Saving his people and making them like Christ. Joseph said the same thing. What you meant for evil, God means for good. I was in that pit. 
I was, a, I was a slave. I was in jail. I went through all of that, not so that I could overcome, but so that my people, God's people, would be saved. The martyrs of the first, second, third century, they went to the cross. They were crucified. They were burned at the stake. They were fed the lions. And the accounts are unbelievable that they would go singing hymns, praising God. Why? Because they knew whatever evil in this world existed, God was going to use it for the good. And what was that good? To save his people. And the Roman Empire couldn't wrap their brain around it. Every time they martyred a Christian, a hundred more people would profess their faith in Jesus. They, they were trying to literally kill Christianity, and every time they took a shot, more people were saved. Why? Because where evil abounds, God's grace abounds more and more and more for you, for me. And that brings me a great encouragement as we look at the world today, church. It's evil, isn't it? It's not getting any better. We're in an avalanche of evil that's going to continue to get worse and worse and worse. And it's easy for me to get discouraged. It's easy for me to go, man, God, why? I love it. I pray. I don't know about you. I pray every day, Lord, right now is a good time to return. Like, it is crazy down here, right? But, church, take heart. Because where evil abounds, God's grace abounds even more. And the reason he hasn't returned yet, the reason this evil is abounding still, is because he's not done saving people. And he's going to do it through the power of the gospel and making you and me more and more like Christ. Because there's people out there who have yet to come into the body of Christ through the power of the gospel that are relying on us. And just like we stand on the shoulders of Paul and Peter and Luther and everyone who's come before us, there is still a magnificent bride out there who's waiting to hear it from us. Because we are intricately, deeply connected. And this evil answers to God and he will use it for good. Let's pray, church. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace. We can't even begin to understand it and we need more and more and more of it. Such good news. God, that you freely give us your grace to swim in, that it's abounding in us more and more and more right now as believers, that it's overflowing all for the purpose of your correction to make us more and more like Jesus. We can't understand how good you are, God, but we can taste it and we know you are good. And so God, we pray as we work through this study of Genesis, as we see evil abounding, we see your grace abound more and more. It overcomes evil time after time after time again for the good of a promise that you've made that you will save your people. And so, God, we come together as the church. First and foremost, we ask that you give us the ability to know you correctly. As we go into Genesis, we're going to see your hand of creation. We're going to be overwhelmed by your power, your majesty, and the works of your hand. We're going to be overwhelmed by your grace. And yet this grace is abounding in us as a promise, but not just for us. God, there's a world out there who needs to hear the truth of the gospel, the power of salvation. And we will not be ashamed of that, God. So we pray right now. We pray that you use us as we go out from this place today where the church gathers as the body, as we go out into the world tomorrow. God, let us take the gospel as our banner. Let us speak freely the truth of God's word. Let us not be ashamed. Let us not be fearful of who you are and what the gospel says in a world that will come against us. Let us not be afraid to speak the truth and grace of the love of Jesus Christ on the cross. But God, make us, make us dangerous in the darkness for your glory. And God, we pray today as we come through this place together, let us worship you out of the experience of the grace you've given us. You are so good. In your great and powerful name, we pray today. Amen. Amen, church. Will you stand with us as we continue to worship our God of grace? Our Father, Creator, you hold our hearts together. There's no one higher than you. Redeemer, defender, our great and mighty Savior. There's no one higher.
you and keep you, and may you be real people who live to lead others to find life in Christ this week, and we'll see you here next week.